I grew up in Switzerland for the first um, 27, 28 years of my life. And then um, made the big trip across the Atlantic Ocean. And I wanted to uh, spend um, the remainder of my years um, in the US. In Switzerland, countries roughly half and half, half Catholic and half what we call Protestant. We don't really make groupings um, beyond that. One half Catholic and the other half Protestant. And I was raised in a Protestant household. My parents did not attend church regularly and we also did not have to do that growing up. I would say my mom is basically a believer, what you'd call a believer nowadays. My dad was never quite as vocal about it. He was, um, for lack of a better term, less of a believer. And more so than my mom actually educated in sciences, which a lot of times mix. I'm thinking that the more people are educated in, in sciences, history too, and all around, the less likely they are to be traditional believers. We would listen to the radio news growing up regularly in the evenings during dinner, in part because my parents opted to have no TV in the house. It's not that I couldn't afford it, but they didn't want it, which was quite a blessing, I think, growing up. We didn't ever waste time um, sitting on our asses and watching TV. As, as children, we would, we would always be outside, being active with our friends, playing sports, but like I said, um, the, the news was basically the evening news on the radio, just listening to it. And when it was over, my dad and the rest of the family would discuss some of what we heard on the news. And I remember oftentimes um, our conversation would drift off a bit and he would always tell us kids that populations as a whole, when you look at big numbers, the less educated a population is or a country or a society the more religious they are in aggregate. <laughs> Nowadays, where I have moved myself ever farther away from traditional teachings and religion towards atheism, um, I remember that, how he, how he said that to me and my siblings. And I cannot necessarily speak for my two siblings. However, they are also nowadays probably closer to atheism than to being believers. And I do understand from what I, although I have been gone now from, from Central Europe for about two decades, I do read on the internet and I get the impression that most of Western Europe has become very secular, uh, meaning that the, the percentage of agnostics and atheists and unaffiliated and non-theists and whatever else you may want to call it is much bigger than here and is growing rapidly uh, and traditional believers are dwindling. And I'm wondering if in that regard, America is just lagging a half a decade or a decade or two decades behind. I'm wondering if that trend will catch on. As much as sometimes when it comes to pop culture, trends um, tend to travel the other direction from America into Europe. Movie, fashion, pop culture, Hollywood shit, artists, bands, um... What are the other crazy people call them? Actors are popular. That usually travels like from west to east on the globe. And now I'm starting to wonder if religious secularism may be traveling a little bit from east to west. Now, I don't mean all the way from the east, not like from Asia, but more like maybe expanding from Europe, Central Europe towards the Americas. <laughs> My middle name is Tina, I'm from Switzerland, and I write the Atheist Underground, and I enjoy it. There is no God. Then why are we whispering? Stand by to receive our transmission. Logic clearly dictates. If you're an atheist, scream atheist! I mean, but what is an atheist? I don't know. An atheist is someone who doesn't quite believe that there is somebody out there, some god out there. So then, to me, you're an idiot. From beautiful downtown in Philadelphia, in the state of apostasy, it's 
The Atheist Underground. Good grief. Welcome to Grief Street. Thank you for writing The Underground. This is Grief Street. Grief Street, getting off the train and walking down Grief Street. This is a lonely fucking alley. Is this for the entire country of the last three years? That we're grieving? Yes. That's why I have anxiety and depression. We're talking about grief, and I wanted to to chime in that uh, member Nancy um, recently lost her husband, and we saw her a couple of weeks ago uh, when she was around for the funeral, but... Uh, she contacted me afterwards. She said to me, you know, the funeral home did a nice job respecting my wishes of a secular service. I, they did a pretty good job all the way through. I really had no complaints, and then they kept it uh, free from religion, just like I requested. But I just got in the mail the guest book with all the signatures of the people who came to pay their respects. And without having decided herself on a style, much like your checkbook, you can choose a background or whatnot for the guest book thing. They just defaulted to a Christian one. And so after all of this went really well for us, she gets <laughs> in the mail, the the memorial, the in memorial book with everybody's signatures, and they had put it on a Christian background with a oh, whole bunch of, you that's know, terrible. probably angels. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like and what, like the very last thing, um, and she was kind of rightfully upset about it. She said it's, you know, to her, it was right away just another example of Christian entitlement in this country. And I think that's a valid uh, perspective that you don't always, when you say Christian entitlement, you think of, um, you know, Christians being able to do what they want as far as like not serving people uh, and this and that. But you don't no think that cakes. this is a way more passive uh, way that this happens when these people weren't, they're not jerks. They weren't trying to be, you know, Christian in your face. They just didn't even assume that you, someone might object to that. They do you just, think maybe they didn't have an option, just like a plain book why option? Why wouldn't they reach out to her? You know, and yeah. say, somebody had to miss, somebody dropped the ball because they already went through the whole secular service. So somebody mm-hmm. in the planning process knew. And so somebody at the end wasn't involved in that chain somehow and just, or I doubt that they, if somebody actively did that, that's just downright mean. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But again, I mean, what do people think about that? that that's, to me, is she was right. That's Christian entitlement. When people just assume that everybody is going to be okay with it, even if maybe you're not religious, how could you object to having God bless you on, you know, the, the, the guest book? How, how's, how, how does that hurt you? It's difficult because that's the last thing that you have to remember that person is all those signatures from the service. And to have it almost seemed like there was no thought put into it and but on the other hand I like I said I maybe there was no other option they just picked a standard but if they went out of their way like you said they went out of their way to abide by what she wanted you'd think that they would have asked. They already knew. Yeah. Mm. Now it just shows how hard you have to go out of your way to try to avoid that. I don't know that I've never had a problem with grief, but I've always dealt with death very well, so. I never needed to talk to somebody, so I'm like the worst person to talk to about grief counseling. Melanie's grief counseling, so she's like Lucy, she's got a five cent stand up, she's like, give her five cents, she's like, get over it. (laughs) Walk it off, sailor. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, the hardest deaths for me to get over were, like, my dog and my rabbit. So, (laughs) I mean, those were the difficult ones. The the relatives I could understand because they were born, they lived to be old, and then they died. That's that's how life goes. One of the saddest funerals I ever have been to was a friend of mine I worked with, and when I went to her funeral... Um, her family had a board of her life. She died very young, and um, it was very sad to see how 
from the beginning when she was a child up to this young adulthood and it just stopped um it, <laughs> it really put into perspective how life how short life is but it was a celebration of what little life she had and it, it was very it was very sad and very touching and it created a, a very human feeling whereas if you had some you know priest or pastor just quoting scriptures and things like that it, it takes away from that humanity of a person's life i think and i, I think we want to remove the religious context but um i do think we should implement rituals that actually celebrate the person's life so. clearly ritual is ingrained in our our dna as a species but i think to jim's point now that we've we've, re we've reached a certain point in our human history where we can look beyond that and realize that any further dallying in ritual is basically that is the de he's right it's, that is the definite definition of religion because you're gonna have faith and you're gonna have belief in God and you're gonna have all kinds of spiritual beliefs without having religion religion is that repeated activity and I think that's why we need to look at you know as I mentioned earlier because we have this um, this ingrained need or desire for ritual I mean, there are ways to implement ritual without religion or a belief in a deity. Well, to be human to me means to reject, be able to reject ritual anytime yeah. it rears its ugly head. Um, but it's comforting to people. I mean, it, it, it does it's, offer it's comfort point, to the living, but also. I've been to funerals um, that were basically parties. There was no. <laughs> I, and those are my favorite kind because. And I'm always the one who is not sad when I. Or not visually sad, I guess, when I go to funerals. When my uncle died, I was sad. When my grandma died, I was sad. But I didn't I didn't go and cry. I didn't go and seek comfort. I went to go celebrate who those people were to me before they passed away. You don't need to have a pastor there. You don't need to have scripture. You don't need the sad music. You don't need to have Bibles laying around and special readings. You can have it so people show up, maybe have a beer if that's allowed in the building, celebrate showing pictures, having a good time, and... Why wouldn't that be more of an acceptable practice? I am familiar with the death rituals that they have in, say, New Orleans. Where there is a period of mourning that the, pro the progression, the procession, rather, down the street, and it's a very mournful experience. And then the dancing breaks out. Okay, the preparation of yourself that you're preparing for this person's passing and after the person is passing, the option of celebrating versus mourning, which is a very healthy thing. And I congratulate you because I would, I wish I had been prepared that way. I wish I were of that mindset to think of the gain of the life that was as opposed to the loss of the life that could have been. What are other ways of grieving differently than religiously? What, they don't what? let you put people on a raft and light it on fire with an arrow anymore. Mm -hmm. that That's should be a how sport. I want to go. <laughs> that should be an Olympic sport. You know, in the upper Midwest here, with our Scandinavian roots, I think we should be allowed to do that. It's our religious freedom. And you have to get it like on the first shot from like 700 yards away at Game of Thrones. <laughs> like the or, the, or the blackfish looks down oh, yeah, upon you. Yeah, smacks you with the back of his Snarls. glove and does it himself. You <laughs> dumb piss ant. Think of the stereotypic Irish wake. Oh my All the wailing gosh. Open bar? Yes. <laughs> That's what I want for three days. And I want each one of my friends to walk away with a monstrous hangover and a big smile saying, we're going to miss that boy, but you know what? Yeah. And religion doesn't run into that. Because once you do get into religion, then you have to second guess. And then you have to say, is, is he in a better place? We don't know. We'll never know. And then mystery occurs. Then you can't let go. Right. Myst religion doesn't allow you to let go because they're in a better place. And you have to imagine that. And you'll see them again one day. No, I'd rather have my good cry. I'd rather let go. I've only experienced two people dying that were close to me, my grandmother and, and my father. And so I wasn't 
terribly close to my dad, but um, but my grandmother, I was very close with. I would see her every single day. I would go over at her house, um, and I remember the the night before her viewing, I wrote a poem. It was a poem about you know how she raised us, and there was some comedy in there, but there was also you know some heartwarming things in there, and I read it. Um, and this poem I actually put in her, her casket to be buried with her because that was my way of, of saying goodbye, Grandma. Um, and so that's that's what I did is I, I wrote a poem and that's how I, I let... So maybe a creative outburst, a, a, yeah. a, a way to work out your grief that way. Yeah. Um, what about access to counseling? Uh, you know, the and back in the day, you know, it's the Circle Be Unbroken style, I carry Grandma off in her coffin and put her in the ground and preacher man comes by and makes you feel better after eating a meal you know and you don't have that maybe uh what, what what's available to people without out just going to a counselor i think just find your local bartender they'll make it it's all usually all better oh sure alcohol way. solves everything man. yeah, yeah. <laughs> the uh, cause of and solution makes to you feel better for friends. a while we work for a pretty large company um which is uh nice for them as a corporation making enough money to have a full-time it's a, uh, it's a chaplain, though, is the way the guy explained it to me. It's the company chaplain. So if you need, you know, some religious counseling or, you know, somebody to help you through your day for whatever reason, you've got this guy that they can afford to keep on for a pretty nice salary, I'm sure. Uh, and I thought immediately that this, again, Christian entitlement, right? What about yeah. Does the he atheist? let you call him Father Mulcahy? <laughs> well, That's you know, like... Father Mulcahy, he'd be all right because he'd work on a humanist thing for you because that was the day that guy if it was catholic he he would have broken out a little catholic thing for you and that's what the chaplain did but the atheists aren't served at all in that instance and probably historically there wasn't much of a need but now in in society as it stands you know where is where is that 30 percent represented well when you go to the hospital say right they have chaplains they don't have any secular counselors you know, you're kind of on your own for that. They'll provide the religious counseling for free. But anything beyond that, if you don't want to hear about how Jesus is going to make you feel better, you're on your own. But yeah, I mean, they don't they don't really have that option. I know in the military they have secular options. <laughs> I think there's like one. Yeah, there's not <laughs> not a whole what lot. What's his name? Do you remember Jason? We should try to. Re- yeah. I think his name is Jason too, wasn't it? If I'm. Yeah. I don't know. Jason Torpy, something like that. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the program the visionary founder and director of the Military Association of Atheists and Free Thinkers, Jason, Jason Torpy. Thanks for joining us via Skype today, Jason. Uh, now, you are not actually a humanist chaplain yourself, are you? No, no, no. That's, that was never my goal. My goal was to, you know, support the troops and to provide, you know, humanist assistance to those personnel and maybe to put humanist chaplains in the military. But uh, there's been all sorts of things. But basically, the DOD is controlled by a bunch of evangelicals, and they're not having it. You know, they don't want anything, anything to do with anybody but the Christians. The theme of the program is grief, Jason. In your experience, do atheists process grief differently than religious folk? At militaryatheist.org, there's a crisis counseling document that we put together with Grief Beyond Belief. You know, I mean, the purpose of that is to speak to like faith-based counselor about how not to screw it up when you're dealing with personnel who are not theistic. And that talks about some different approaches. Like, for example, if you're going to a religious person, you'd say, oh, well, you know, God has a plan, right? Don't say that to us because it just makes us mad. Okay, now, on the other hand, uh, just as an example, nobody's out to get you. One of the arguments that a grief counselor has talking with a believer is trying to explain how God has a plan is a comforting thing or how that plan that God has involved their kid getting cancer or you know somebody getting killed in a car wreck right that's a real hard sell but when you talk to somebody who's non-theistic then they understand that the universe kind of operates how it does uh, you know phys- the forces of physics aren't um, being tipped in one favor or another and sometimes bad things just happen 
and and dealing with the idea that you know cancer or you know death or whatever whatever bad thing happened that you're dealing with the grief from understanding that that happened as a fact and not having to dig into the underlying theodicy of why uh, is is sometimes an easier sell you know for these grief counselors and and I find it helpful to kind of point that out because sometimes you know faith-based grief counselor will just not even understand oh well, I don't even have to do the whole problem of evil thing right it's just not not a problem for for atheists so how do they approach it the best thing is in you know I'm not a professional grief counselor uh, but my understanding uh, the approach we've got facts right these are things that happened and you know the world will go on but the most common thing I think is a celebration of life while we don't physically live on you know, everybody dies eventually uh, our memories do live on in others and the impacts people have have on each other uh, that is relevant so being able to take time first to grieve right you know, we're sad when bad things happen you know psychologically speaking you can't ignore that grief cycle but you know when when people are ready and to the extent it's appropriate then I think there's a lot of comfort to be had in celebrating the impact that people had on the world to, to look at, the, remember the good times um, and remember the positive memories you had and, and how you know each individual who lives on is a better person because of that person who's no longer there. Uh, it's, it's, it's almost an oxymoron, right? When you say humanist chaplain, it's like, why wouldn't it just be a humanist counselor? Or to play devil's advocate, wouldn't a critic just say, why don't they just get counseling, go, go to a therapist or whatever? Why, why does an atheist need the services of a chaplain? They should just, you know, deal deal without that part. Well, first, let's set aside the terminology we call chaplain, counselor, or whatever. On the one hand, you know, it's not necessarily important what people are called, but if you do look at those different groupings, right? There's psychologists and sociologists, behavioral therapists, things like that. We know all those different areas and. Those are all jobs with job descriptions and educational qualifications, right? And then with the, when you look at, you know, what's normally called a chaplain, that's somebody who has a strong faith, faith foundation themselves, core values and beliefs that they're drawing from, and they address those individuals, they address people that they're caring for from that perspective of core values and beliefs. If it's in the standard, you know, the most common expression of, you know, Christian to Christian, then they can say, okay, let's read scripture, let's understand you know, the Ten Commandments or the Great Commandment or, or whatever kind of scriptural basis they are. And what they're doing is speaking to people's core values and beliefs, their moral framework and how they understand the world. And that's most valuable when something that, when something has happened that really offends someone's moral framework. You know, my kid died, I thought God was good, but my kid died and that's bad. So how am I going to reconcile those things? When we talk about core values, when those core values are offended so badly, then people really have trouble recovering. Now, if you look at it from an atheist perspective, and whether that's a humanist or, you know, uh, like the Satanic Temple is kind of non theistic but still very humanist in nature, Church of Satan is a different kind where they're non theistic as well, but they're kind of selfish in nature as opposed to humanist. And then there's Buddhists who are not theistic and Jews who are non theistic. When you approach things from those perspective, people still have core values and beliefs. People still have a moral framework that they're operating on. And they still have lives that they're living that you know have these foundational concepts, whether they're theistic or non-theistic. So when a chaplain approaches somebody, they say, listen, I as a chaplain have worked on my own core values and beliefs and studied various core values and beliefs, looked at different moral frameworks and and gone through life addressing people in that manner. So when they talk to a humanist or a Buddhist, you know, a secular Buddhist or, you know, a secular Jew or, you know, somebody who doesn't have a God framework, it doesn't really matter because they have some framework. And that framework of values and beliefs is something that the chaplain can address and strengthen and kind of reform in the context of that of that grief. So that the person can say, I have a certain moral framework, I understand you know, what happened now, and I can kind of move on 
it may take a while, but but people use those core values and beliefs, not just active listening, not just psychology, not medicine. They use core values and beliefs to understand and and deal with that grief. Secular counselor is not the same as chaplain, right? A counselor is going to talk to you, right? A chaplain is going to maybe talk to you, but they, it's a values-based support. They're going to say, who's your community? You know, what are your values? How can I get you reading materials? How can I get you a space to, to meditate on these, you know, on these ideas? How can I connect you to your local community, connect you to clergy professionals or, you know, humans professionals as well? You know, all of those things are not going to be done by just a secular counselor. Have you noticed that perhaps atheists um, suffer from a, la- a lack of community? In, you know, religious people have their whole church community and everybody in their family is also religious. Or atheists may be being loners. Uh, have you noticed anything like that? Do atheists maybe suffer more from simply a lack of, of, of understanding supporters around them? Well, I would say what you have, you know, in the United States, right? The most common religion is whatever. Like people don't pay attention, they don't plug into their community, whatever. But uh, and the second most common is whatever my parents were. And maybe they say they're Christian or whatever. Maybe even they they even go to church sometimes, but they don't really think about it. They just kind of by default fell into their beliefs. With atheists, humanists, other non-theists, they probably didn't fall into that just because statistically speaking, they probably were. Right. Most were born into a religion, which they then left. So they moved away from mom and dad so there's no community um and there's none of the you know none of the guilt you know or fear-based tactics that often keep together religious communities that are based on you know salvation or rules or so so we don't have some of the some cultural you know sticks that that religious communities have to keep us together so it's it's just even more important that you know, non-theistic communities, you know, values-based communities come together and continue to support each other. And it's that much more important that chaplain employers who have 27 Christians on staff maybe consider having some humanists or, for that matter, some Hindus or Muslims, which are lower density offerings, because, you know, we really need to marginalize the smaller communities, we really need that need that support that paid staff member a lot more than somebody you know who's lutheran and has 27 churches in a one mile radius to choose from if they want some support uh you're speaking of of industry in general it sounds like not just the military yes i mean it's the case at any given hospital or you know fire department for that matter the secret service prisons basically any any kind of government or even kind of quasi-government institution like hospitals or airports they they have chaplains on staff because evangelical christians have made sure that religion is ever present in society we could say oh you know it's bad that christians are here and that's you know that's not really doing anybody any favors but when we when we understand that that addressing values within the community and moral frameworks are you know, that can be helpful to a lot of people, and it's really something sh- people shouldn't leave to chance, then these these positions, the, the question becomes, okay, what's the diversity of materials? What's the diversity of advertising, diversity of services? And, you know, as a last priority, what's the diversity of the chaplains themselves? Uh, and, you know, often there's not a consideration for humanists uh, and other non-theists, uh, and there really should be because, you know, Christians have plenty of support. Um, and humanists and other non-theists often have no support. Tell us how people can uh, can get involved. Where do they go? Where do they find you? How do they support? Militaryatheist.org is the website, and you can Google it. Uh, but when you go there, you'll you'll find information about the military atheist community. If you're in the military, obviously we want to help you uh, to understand and navigate the, you know, the extremely religious military community you find yourself in, um, because your chaplain is probably not willing to help, even if they smile and talk to you. Uh, it, it generally doesn't work out, so reach out to militaryatheist.org to find community. Uh, if you're a veteran, understand that the military is still difficult, and People need your help to understand the the most important thing that most people can probably do is from a civilian side is to um, contact the Military Association of Atheists and Freethinkers for ideas on how to 
get a get a, a liaison to the organization, a veteran liaison, uh, somebody who can kind of understand the military perspective, and use that liaison to connect with enlist, enlistment processing centers, to connect with veterans hospitals, and to do military themed activities such as parades uh, and other holiday events to make sure that your community knows that atheists are in foxholes and that your atheist or humanist group has military personnel and, and deserves the respect and inclusion that, that military are often afforded. Great stuff. Now uh, you're, you, you're aware of uh, the other Jason, right? Jason Heap, uh, not, not able to break into the Navy, right? We were very closely involved in that, and unfortunately, the Navy just made up new rules and convinced the military not to accept uh, the very quali- highly qualified candidates we were providing. So, um, but there are 5,000 chaplains in the United States military, and those 5,000 chaplains should be supporting humanists just as much as they support Jews and Hindus and Muslims, because the fact is there are more atheists in the military than Jews and Hindus and Muslims combined. Jason Torpy, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Now here with an alternative eulogy for your secular stiff is AU's own Nikolai on Science with a piece by Aaron Freeman. You want a physicist to speak at your funeral. You want the physicist to talk about the conservation of energy so they will understand that your energy has not died. You want the physicist to remind your sobbing mother about the first law of thermodynamics, that no energy gets created in the universe and none is destroyed. You want your mother to know that all your energy, every vibration, every BTU of heat, every wave of every particle that was her beloved child remains with her in this world. And you want the physicist to tell your weeping father that amid energies of the cosmos, you gave as good as you got. And at one point, you'd hope the physicist would step down from the pulpit and walk to your broken-hearted spouse there in the pew and tell him that all the photons that ever bounce off your face, all the particles whose paths were interrupted by your smile, by the touch of your hair, hundreds of trillions of particles have raced off like children, their ways forever changed by you. And as your widow rocks in the arms of a loving family, May the physicist let her know that all the photons that bounce from you were gathered in the particle detectors that are her eyes. That those particles created within her constellations of electromagnetically charged neurons whose energy will go on forever. You can hope that your family will examine the evidence and satisfy themselves that the science is sound and that they'll be comforted to know your energy is still around. According to the law of the conservation of energy, not a bit of you is gone. You're just less orderly. Presents Grumpy Jim's. What do you mean, Grumpy? Libertarian Minute. I'm Libertarian. What is insurance? Insurance itself is a kind of religion. You know, Jesus talks in, was it Matthew, about take no thought for the morrow, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, consider the birds of the air and beasts of the field. You know, they sow not, neither they reap, but God and all his glory takes care of them, right? Well, this is kind of an Jesus pronouncing against insurance. I mean, what is insurance? Thought about tomorrow. What does that mean? An accident? I could die? I want to take care of my family? Jesus says, forget about that stuff. So insurance is totally non-Christian. But Christians being sheep will participate in Obamacare or anything that promises, uh, you know, this kind of heavenly absence of uh, 
of illness or or or, or, or the conquering of, 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 of illness which afflicts all of mankind. And to me, an atheist should not participate in that sort of stuff. This has been Grumpy Jim's Libertarian Minute. Join us next time. The opinions expressed are not necessarily those of this station, the producers, or anybody, in fact, other than Grumpy Jim. Here now with secular news and events and commentary is NPR voice guy Alex. In a move likely to appeal to his Christian supporters, U.S. President Donald Trump's administration has permanently spared Bibles printed in China from his tariff plans. The U.S. Trade Representative's office said on Wednesday that Bibles were among about 25 product categories that were removed from 10% tariffs due to take effect on September 1st and December 15th. Other products removed because of their importance include child safety seats, cranes used in ports and construction, shipping containers, and certain types of fish. But rosaries and other personal religious items that are imported from China will still be hit by the 10% tariff on September 1st, according to the USTR tariff list released on Tuesday. About 60% of these imported religious items come from China. $11 million worth last year, according to a Reuters analysis of the U.S. Census Bureau data. In May, Bibles and other religious texts printed in China, which totaled $91.7 million, or 65% of the total 2018 U.S. imports in the category, were placed on a list of items for tariffs of up to 25% as part of a broader $794 million category of printed books, brochures, and leaflets. The so-called Bible tax would hinder churches and other religious organizations in their mission to spread the Word of God, said Mark Schoenwald, chief executive of HarperCollins Christian Publishing at the USTR hearing in June. Which fish are so important that they can't be taxed? That's, that's one of the first things that I wanted to ask <laughs> when I read this. So I actually looked up these are those tar- betas? I bet they're beta fish. <laughs> probably it's probably whatever fish. fucking McDonald's needs. Whatever <laughs> McDonald's uses or whoever uses the most fish in the country has that kind of power to say, look, you know what? It's not going to happen. But yeah, I, I actually looked up these tariff lists, both of them. They're long and they're very specific. So you could probably figure out what fish it is just by going through the list and crossing them off. Boy. Like a filter fish, you can't put ten percent on that, Donald. <laughs> what are you doing? Uh, wh- what about uh, the fact that like every other trinket, right? It's only Bibles, you know. But and every other trinket is is gonna get tagged. Bibles and religious printed materials. You think the Jehovah's Witnesses <laughs> pamphlets? The, are? Uh, the uh, New American Standard version of the Bible. I think that counts as Bible. They don't say. They don't say if there's specific revisions of the Bible that are included or not. That's a big selling item. A lot of lot of Chinese Bibles. China. A Republican candidate for Mississippi governor told a female reporter that he couldn't be interviewed by her unless she was accompanied by a male colleague, later claiming he was following the Billy Graham rule. We just wanted to keep things professional, said GOP hopeful Robert Foster, The female reporter, Larison Campbell of Mississippi Today, had been asking to go on a ride-along with Foster when his campaign director reportedly refused on his behalf. Foster's campaign director said a male colleague would need to accompany Campbell on an upcoming 15-hour campaign trip because they believe the optics of the candidate with a woman, even a working reporter, could be used in a smear campaign to insinuate an extramarital affair, Campbell wrote. Vice President Mike Pence used a similar excuse back in 2002 when he reportedly told The Hill that he refuses to eat alone with any woman other than his wife. Foster was receiving backlash Wednesday in response to his decision and issued multiple statements in response. As I anticipated, the liberal left lost their minds over the fact I chose not to be alone with another woman, he tweeted. They can't believe that even in 2019, someone still values their relationship with their wife and upholds their Christian faith. He added, 
I will not be intimidated into a corner of silence by a group of radical socialists and communists whose goal in life is to dismantle America. In fact, I'm looking forward to fight their radical left-wing agenda. It sounds like he fucks every woman he's alone in a room with. Or at to least me. Tries like he cannot to. control That's himself. the impression that's created. I don't, <laughs> right. I, right. I don't get the impression of, of I don't get a uh, virtuous uh, yeah. vibe from that. I get no. the I'm a super creep and I need someone there. I can't there be trusted proof. there and everyone is going to accuse me of yeah. macking on someone. Right. And when he says let's keep it professional, how is that professional? By demanding that a professional who should be trusted to do her job without coming on to you, you hottie. You hot Christian man. What if you? I slip and fall and then, yeah. you know. I mean, have you looked at this guy? No one wants to sleep with him. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and saying that you you need that because you value your relationship with your spouse or girlfriend, whatever. It almost sounds like they don't trust you. So if you yeah, have no trust in that, that relationship, exactly. then that's why you're doing it. You don't try to pass this that's off. That's exactly right. What, what I don't understand is, I mean, if he has a spouse, why can't he invite her with to the interview himself instead of putting the onus on the reporter to have somebody else there? How's he talking about a good marriage and respecting a marriage when he can't be trusted to be alone right. with a woman? Absolutely ridiculous. And it strikes me as pandering. Again, I don't think he necessarily really feels this way. I think that he thinks his constituency will lap this up. Oh, what a good Christian. How respectful he is of and his wife. And it could be someone told him to spin it that way, but I think it's more damage control than... <laughs> well, and it's and it's also like this kind of stupid idea that, oh, this is where all these sexual allegations come from. This is just a misunderstanding because somebody was in, alone in a room with a woman and then they accused him of sexual assault, but nothing happened. So just so that that doesn't happen to me, I won't even be alone with... I mean, that's bullshit. That's not what happens. It's not, oh, everyone's looking to accuse you if they can get you alone in a room where, you know, no one knows what happens. And that's, and the, oh, the liberal left. This guy definitely is a Republican. For the new school year, South Dakota public schools will be required to display the national motto, In God We Trust. A bill signed by Governor Kristi Noem mandates that the words be on display for students to see beginning the 2019-2020 school year. The display can be on anything the principal feels is appropriate for their school, like a plaque or student artwork. But there are requirements. The display must be at least 12 inches square and must be in a prominent location, the bill said. You don't want anybody cheating and trying to sneak a tiny one in there and these atheists in school. The bill also protects the schools from legal trouble that may arise from the move. Any schools that face a lawsuit or complaint as a result will be defended by the state attorney general at no cost. If the school becomes responsible for legal fees or monetary damages, the state will take those on. Lawmakers have heard concerns that displaying the motto may alienate students of non-Christian backgrounds. A group of Stevens High School students in Rapid City spoke to their school board to propose a modification to the sign that would include mention of science, Allah, Yahweh, the spirits, Buddha, Brahman, and ourselves in addition to God, according to CNN affiliate KOTA-TV. I think that's a really fundamental element of American society, that we are a cultural melting pot. It's really important that we make all people who come to America feel welcome in accordance to the First Amendment since we all have the freedom of religion, student Abigail Ryan told KOTA TV. The board heard the opinion but took no action, the station said. Yeah, so South Dakota, great job um, in the running now for the stupidest state. Well, I think it'll definitely stop all the school shootings. That's an absolute... 100%. Yes, like a shield around Wakanda. Right? <laughs> and nothing's getting through that. Uh, I, I get, it, you know, it's, hard to, it's hard to say that schools shouldn't display the national motto. That's the real shame here, that this is the national motto. You know what I mean? It's like, how do you tell a school? It's the friggin' national motto. It's, there's almost no way to fight this except to try to fight to get it removed in favor of the true national motto and one that reflects our nation and the way it was really founded, e pluribus unum, right? Mm, out of, out many of many one. one. And then that, you know, I, I remember proudly learning that in school. And maybe being God We Trust was already the co-national motto at that point. I'm sure it was in the 70s. But 
you know, we never, we we learned about the, the founders and we learned about yeah. the, the the melting pot and all of these people coming together from different backgrounds and making a cool country where you could do anything you wanted. Well, it's definitely not the national motto now. Now it's get the fuck out of here, brown people. <laughs> I sh- the one thing that bothers me is I, I think South Dakota is one of the few states that can actually get away with doing this because I don't know how represented they are by other religions. Because it's not just atheists that would have a problem with this being on, on a wall or on anything in the right. school, even though it is a big issue. There's other religions that don't believe in a Christian God. So oh, they'll argue they... up and down that this includes all gods. Well, it doesn't say in Christian <laughs> God we trust. Right, it, but, you know? but it's very plain that... Oh, yeah, we know. It's, it's like not all of our money. It's the, yeah, it's the wink and the nod. We don't really mean Jesus. Yeah. Wink, but wink. It, but it's their way out, their loop. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Allah is just the Arab word for God. Yeah. So. It's dumb. I don't like it. Yeah. It, it's annoying that they think how, it'll, it'll how, create patriotism when it's clearly divisive. Right. It's going to cause, div- cause division divisive. among people. In fact, they showed a study that uh, in the past that uh, atheists actually um, get persecuted as outsiders when you have bands of Christians in school together Christian there are Christian bullies towards atheists and this is what it's what's going to cause is because these atheists are going to feel like outsiders they're not going to feel welcome in a school where they should be school should be about education this is this is antithetical to education. This is, is has nothing to do with it. It's a reverse of education. It's going back to, to stupidity is what it's doing. In conference news, recovering from religion, fall excursion happens September 20th through the 22nd in Mars Hill, North Carolina. Recovering from religion offers a retreat in the woods. Embrace your nature is their motto this year. Our excursion is set amidst the tranquil mountains of North Carolina in a private venue where attendees can find guidance, friendship, and experience personal growth in a warm and accepting environment. Speakers include Mandisa Thomas, Candace Gorham, and more. Enjoy a nature hike with Daryl Ray, a dogma-free sexuality discussion and workshop, and a Fear of Hell group support session with Haley Twyman Brack. They have planned events and workshops all weekend long, For more information, please go to recoveringfromreligion.org. That's all for Grief Street. Get your asses back on the train. We will try to get to somewhere more cheerful. In a hurry, I'd like to remind you that Atheist Underground is sponsored in part by Kraft, Kenosha Racine Atheists and Free Thinkers, Freedom From Religion in Southeast Wisconsin, Thanks to all our great guests. Do remember to support us on Patreon if you can, and we will see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Next stop, non-land. Non-land is next.